George? Poverty is one of the most significant um, causes of environmental degradation. Undermining the economy on salt spring is not going to help the preserve and protect mandate. What we have to do is to shift our economy to a rather more sustainable base. And, and in order to do that, I think we have to look at how we can make it um, more um, low environmental impact, uh, reduce our ecological footprint, and what type of industry do we need to devise with the help of the Chamber of Commerce, with Salt Spring entrepreneurs, with the Economic Development Commission, what sort of industry would help us do that, and how do we transition to that? It's a long exercise that's going to take some time, and I think the Integrated Community Sustainability Plan will help um, um, identify that path. Thanks, George. Uh, yeah, they were just talking about the different aspects, and we've always been a country that keeps falling back on commodities, and that's been our curse, and everyone realized we've got to get away from that. And there's, uh, is it Andrew Weber's, the MLA for Oak Bay, that area, he talks about sustainable plans moving forward, and tourism has always been a big part of it, and long-term health care is probably, we can attract people that way. We just feel that this is a community that offers a lot of support services, and that might be an avenue that there's opportunity. Thank you. Wayne? Uh, my uh, background is in technology, and I think there's tremendous opportunities. Uh, unlike the southern Gulf Islands that don't have access to much high-speed internet access, we do. I, I must say to the Chamber of Commerce, it's been a real pleasure to collaborate on a lot of these uh, activities we have with the Economic Development Commission. I think one of the things we found out is that there's been a lot of uh, different <coughs> businesses that haven't talked to each other. One of the biggest things we found in you know, developing the uh, economic development plan is the fact that we got people talking. I think we've got a lot of energy and we've got a lot of uh, opportunities to bring in a lot of new green business. So, thank you to the Chamber. Earth? Um, yes, I just wanted to say I'm just so delighted that I've heard uh, at this table mentions made of the Community Economic Development Commission on a number of occasions and I'm just so pleased that that body has been able to do things that have um, made it uh, or are starting to make it a better place to work and live in our community. So. Thanks, Harris. Next question, Nellis. Hello, my name is Brenda Dow. Uh, this is for the CRB candidates, please. Um, you have to dispense the community gas tax funds, which I believe are about $330,000 per year, which over three years adds up to close to a million dollars. Uh, Garth Hankin Garth put uh, $549,000 worth of that money, which does come from cap gas tax and use of our roads, into the first phase of the North Ganges trans transportation plan. Uh, and he then he partnered, he got a partner with the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure as well as CRD Victoria and got uh, brought in nearly another million dollars which gave us the first road upgrade that we've had on Salt Spring in decades. It's an upgrade. The only other money that has been spent on road work in the previous decades was about four thousand dollars on a piece of sidewalk on Hereford. So, my question then to uh, Garth is, what was your thinking in doing that? And to uh, Wayne, I've been all over the internet looking for the ways in which you have spent the $990,000, and I'm sorry I can't find anything. Could you please let us know how you have spent our community gas tax funding? Thank you. Garth first. So the question was why did I do it? Yeah, what was your thinking behind Well, I mean, first of all, you know, um, <laughs> It was sort of like, and, and I'll be really honest with you, it was an easy piece. It was a piece that needed to be done uh, for all kinds of reasons. Um, anybody who drives the roads or tries to walk on them recognizes that we had severe problems. And the, there were strings attached to this, the gas tax funds. And at that time, and I think it's changed since, 
now, but at that time you could uh, devote those funds to water, water infrastructure, it all had to be infrastructure, or you could devote it to transportation. Okay, those were the two pieces. Um, we, uh, and I just chose that uh, we should devote it to transportation, principally at that point, the bus, the bus service, because part of the money went to the upgrade, uh, the expansion, of, uh, the first expansion of the bus service after it was initi initiated under Gary Holman. So that was my reason. Would I do it differently if I was starting all over again? I don't think so. Um, I, there's lots of things that need to be done, uh, but given the conditions under which that money could be expended, uh, they, uh, the limitations are, are still there. Uh, excuse me, the same limitations would still apply. Wayne? <clears throat> okay, of course the uh, committee works under what's commonly called the gas tax as a competitive fund. We have a lot of requirements, our infrastructure is crumbling. But as far as specifically with transportation, <clears throat> I think I was the one that signed off on, on the gas tax for the, for the first part of the North Canadian's transportation plan. As far as the budget goes for the Transportation Commission, I, I said subject to any uh, specific plans being in place, I was prepared to put either 60% or 200,000 of the uh, gas tax fund every year into uh, transportation infrastructure. So I think you could certainly say I've been committed to uh, using the money I think is the best way possible and balancing all the various needs of our community. Thank you. Thank you. Ready for the next question? Questions to uh, Mr. Hendron. Uh, you were part of a group that uh, was a law case fought out on since 2011. And uh, do you recognize the validity of the Court of Appeal decision, which also included yourself, notwithstanding the fact that you were uh, left off the list uh, when the case went to appeal? Do you recognize the validity of the case? You were in conflict of interest in the case of the uh, giving of money to two organizations on the island that you were also a director of while you were an elected official. I just want a, want a confirmation whether you recognize the validity of a court's decision or whether you're familiar with that court. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to start off by saying that uh, the action against me was dismissed by the judge on both accounts of the community charter and on the legal, uh, on the uh, on the Community Charter Act, excuse me, that it was dismissed so that there was nothing came of it. Now that didn't apply to uh, the two other people. As far, excuse me, I can't speak for the other uh, plaintiffs, uh, but uh, I can just speak for myself. So, but that's not what your question was. Your question was, do I recognize that I was in conflict? No, I don't. I did not think I was in conflict. So, so you, you don't believe you were in conflict on just, any of this? Just clarification only. Well, yeah, well, I need a clarification here because there was a judgment that included Mr. Hendricks. You know, if he doesn't recognize a conflict of interest, is he going to recognize it in the future? It was dismissed. That's right. We don't need a debate. Something to think about. I just thought was so the next question. We have ample time. I don't think we need to be too concerned about the exact order. Yeah. Okay. Um, this question is about holding trustee Graham's accountable. So first, I want to say that I sincerely appreciate that you have taken up the challenge of being a trustee and done your best, I'm sure. But you signed a petition um, that's not online anymore, but I have a copy that you now know contains false allegations against the trust and against former elected officials in support of the metal recycling business. If it had been me, I hope I would have um, apologized to the community for contributing to the spread of false and inflammatory information. And why, when concerned citizens asked to meet with you, 
before that cru crucial rezoning vote, did you agree? And then uh, only to have us informed the afternoon before that meeting that you would not be there. Before I became a trustee, I expressed sympathy for John Connell's predicament, and I participated in this pet petition. There's nothing improper in taking a position as I did as a private citizen on a tropical island issue that's been controversial for a decade or more. And as a private resident, I have a right to do that. What would have been improper was if I'm taking office, I'd allowed my sympathy for John Cornell to cloud my judgment in the merits of his application. So the action I took as soon as I was appointed as a trustee or elected as a trustee, one of the first courses of action was to phone our CEO, Linda Adams, uh, make full disclosure to Linda Adams, seek staff advice. I was referred to legal counsel. I obtained legal counsel's advice, and I posed the question, should I recuse myself from further decisions on John Connell's application? The advice I obtained uh, validated my um, decision to still participate. Trustees who recognize potential conflict or bias situations, who act in that recognition by seeking advice from staff and legal counsel, and who then follow that advice to the letter, are um, no threat to good governance on this island. What is a threat to good governance is trustees who don't. You know, it's not easy for sitting trustees to knowingly make themselves magnets for accusations and threats. And, and by participating, I did that. It would have been much easier for me to accuse myself from that participation. To avoid that minefield, leave the hard decisions to Peter and Sheila while I sat in the car park and had a cup of coffee. But it would have also been cowardly. And so with staff's guidance and help, I decided that I would face the vituperation that I did. Uh, as a trustee. And, uh, meeting with, I, I acted on our planning manager's advice with regard to that meeting and its cancellation. No more than that. Next question. Uh, my name is Doreen Hewitt. Uh, I'm asking this question of all four of the uh, trustee candidates. Will you read the entire complete agenda package prepared for each and every local trust committee meeting and how much research will you do before considering an application or do you feel that this is the job of the planning staff and will rely on the staff report for your information? Peter? Uh, I'm not entirely sure that I understand your question but, uh, but my answer is that I'm um, speaking for myself I mean, I spend a great deal of time looking at those packages that come out before each LTC, um, and uh, we'll go down to the site, if it is a particular site or development, to see what they're talking about. I talk to staff. I'm ensure that I understand it completely before attending that LTC meeting. I consider that my, my responsibility and my duty, and I take that very, very seriously. Uh, who else would like to respond? I think the question is asked of the entire panel. So, Christine? Um, thank you for your question, Doreen. Um, certainly, I think that for rezoning applications, considering the delicate nature of our, our ecosystem here and the health of our water, I think it's really important to be, be thorough about each application that comes. Um, in terms of the, the meetings, certainly looking over the agendas is, is, is important. Um, but I, I have a vested interest in, in maintaining the health of our ecosystems <coughs> and would do everything that I can to, to ensure that that is protected. Thank you. I'll just agree that you know we should always be prepared for meetings. That everyone shows up expecting answers, and uh, and sometimes we just have to live with that. We got to consult with different people and have you know all the homework done so that you know no one's disappointed when they show up. Thank you. 
Uh, George, um, we don't serve a community properly unless we read the agenda packages properly and understand the issues. Um, that's an absolute obligation on behalf of the trustee, and sometimes it's quite onerous. I've seen agenda packages run 180 pages, for example, every three weeks. And so part of the duty is absorbing that, understanding the issues, meeting the planners if there are issues that, or queries that we have prior to the local trust committee meetings, and, and ensuring that we're fully informed. Um, however, following the planning advice or planner's advice is, is, is not always what we do. And it's, the planning process is, is deliberately, uh, has that deliberate political component because if it was simply empirical, you wouldn't need politicians. You simply give it to the planners and then you would have the answer. But there are other issues, social, economic, etc., that play in these decisions that need a political uh, um, component to them. And so, uh, you know, it, it's a system we have and, and it's, it's got its flaws, but it's the best we can do. Thank you. Uh, next question. Um, well, given that um, we've all been really seriously warned uh, throughout the world this week about climate change, and given that um, the studies have been done for a while on Salt Spring, that the two major sources here for greenhouse gases are transportation and wood heating stoves, what do you think can be done to remedy it? here with those being the two biggest factors? Um, climate change is a reality and, and we have to adapt to it. Um, it's how we adapt to it. Now I think we have to prepare as a society, we have to reduce our, our, um, uh, our greenhouse gas emissions, we have to stop burning fossil fuels and we have to transition to uh, a low carbon economy. However, even if we stopped producing greenhouse gases entirely on Salt Spring or entirely in Canada, the chances are the rest of the world is going to um, uh, be less than diligent in pursuing the same means. So my belief is whilst pursuing that particular path to a low carbon economy, our best steps is to prepare for resilience. Um, be prepared for it coming. Um, because beyond our borders, we can't prevent it. Climate change is one of those things that, that knows no borders. Oh, wow. yeah. What's your, uh, you know, how do you deal with fear? I'm yeah, sorry, could I, yeah. I will answer the question I understood from you. And um, George, um, I echo what you say. We must be aware always of the environmental issues, and we are. Our SEP has some very stringent um, requirements in terms of dealing with uh, environment and with climate, and the uh, um, Islands Trust policy statement um, through which every, every bylaw that we create here on Salt Spring has to be run also does the same thing. I mean, we have these realities and we have to deal with what we can do. We have water issues and we need to address those. I want to, I want to work, work, as I said, with the CRD to start requiring rainwater capture for all new houses. I think we need to be looking at increased, improved insulation codes. We have to look at rainwater recycle, recycling and we have to look at solar power. We have to do what we can do here on this island to protect ourselves from what is already coming and has come and is coming. And um, that is the way I would approve, uh, approach that. Christine? Thank you. So, in, on the topic of adapting, so one of the things with transition salt spring. On the topic of what? What? On the topic of what? Adapting to climate change. I'm not talking, I didn't, that was my question. My question was being that salt spring's two major contributions are through transportation and wood heating, mm -hmm. what's to be done with those two? Well, I, th I think that 
Well, with transportation, I mean, we have we have a public transportation system. We can encourage electric vehicles. I think bike lanes would be really amazing. Um, and uh, yeah, just just making it easier for people to, to get around. Certainly, um, I don't know much about wood stoves. Personally, I think that would be a building code thing that the CRD would deal with. But in terms of what I, I would do as, as a trustee um, is to work with community groups, and this is something that's in the OCP as well, is our capability of working with community groups that are doing restoration work. Because we have green sinks, we have blue sinks. Um, the blue is, is the eelgrass forest, which uh, the, uh, certain groups have been doing this restoration work, and I think encouraging that more. Having um, a harbor plan for Ganges Harbor to, to revitalize the, the environment there. I think that also um, making sure that, that we're not clear cutting our forests, making sure that, that the carbon sequestration is, is, is a paramount concern here. Um, Definitely decreasing emissions is, is really important and we do have a plan to decrease emissions by 15% in 2015, something like that. And, and we, we should, yeah, we should know whether or not. Any other problems? Uh, there's been some uh, grants recently for electric buses, so that's been in the news. And if that's something we can look at, we're eligible for. And a lot of it's just been trends with vehicles. You talk about transit and our own vehicles. In 2000, we went the wrong direction. That was just a social trend, and it seems we're starting to go the right way. And hopefully, people just realize that being sensible, what we do transportation-wise, is the best direction to move in the future. Wayne, uh, we were fortunate to get the community support for the expansion of the bus service. Because, quite frankly, that's the, the biggest and the quickest hit we can get on the issue. I think the other set uh, are the electric vehicles and having increased uh, access to plug-in stations and the car stop program. <clears throat> so I think all of those are, are very viable. As far as looking at the longer term and things like electric buses, there's lots of incredible technology coming up and, and we should, uh, we have a transportation commission and these are the, the type of things that they're constantly looking at and seeing if we have opportunities in, in those fields. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, of course, the, trans the public transportation piece is a way of reducing marginally, but nevertheless do doing some reduction. Uh, I would like to weigh in, though, on I, I think one of the areas where we can make some change is through the building code. I think the building code is a document that is not used enough uh, and certainly in this particular way could uh, encourage the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions because if you had a well insulated home you would not have to burn as much wood basically bottom line um, uh, I, the, the building code can also weigh in on heating I mean as a piece of the construction of the building so uh, we could it could provide a description as to other kinds of heating that could be used I don't think it, it can't be it's not prescriptive the building code isn't prescriptive so there's that. Uh, so it's a way of uh, moving us along. They're all. They're, they're, we're not going to make great progress, but it's. I figure any kind of progress is better than no progress at all. So okay. So that's what I would do. You think the panel is trying to make me feel guilty for having a 1956 package before the turn program over? <laughs> <laughs> Next question. Very much. Uh, this is on, everybody can hear. My name is John McPherson. I've lived on Salt Spring for 15 years and I chaired the Government Study Committee in 2013. I'm interested to know if candidates are unequivocal in their support of a provincially sponsored incorporation study, as was recommended about a year ago in November. Uh, that would be under the province's established protocols focusing on structure and procedures. I did see in the Driftwood, Ms. Grimes has an interest in how environmental impacts might be addressed by such a study. So I'd ask if she might take the lead on this, and I ask all candidates to explain their position in terms of their support, is it qualified or unqualified? Thanks. 
Ms. Christine, you were asked first. Yes, thank you. Um, well, the Islands Trust mandate is so crucial on, on this island. Um, we have a very sensitive ecosystem. We have finite resources here. And the mandate was put in place to help to prevent um, runaway development, which I think is the development pressure here is, is quite strong, uh, from what I understand. And so, if there's an incorporation study, I would really hope that, um, that the environment and, and the long-term sustainability of the ecosystems here, the health of, of the creatures that live here, not just us, um, is deeply considered in an incorporation study. Uh, John, uh, I fully support, as you well know, an incorporation study, and there's been a lot of talk about governance on this island, and we simply, and as three years ago I said, and I say the same thing today, we do not, we cannot have that conversation until we have the facts. We need to have the facts about the costs, what it would imply, how, uh, how it would work, and with, with that kind of information, when we get it, because I'm sure we will, we're going to press the government until they come up with, with an incorporation study. So we have that information. We really can't have the discussion. And I look forward to that uh, conversation very much. Yeah, I look at it as long-term community. That is kind of where we've always had our success and where people should get credit. And I don't look at more government as always a solution. So that's my take on it. George? Um, I've one of the first things I did when I came into office is read the Islands Trust Act back to front to understand the legislation that really governed my position. And there is nothing in the Islands Trust Act that it gives trustees the, the right or the responsibility to make decisions on behalf of their electorate as far as uh, the choice of governments is required. So I take no position on governments. It's up to you. Not for me to lead, but to be your servant in this. And you have an absolute right to be informed about what your choices are with regard to governance, to collect the facts, to consider them, and then to make a choice. And that is where I act as your servant. The Islands Trust Act recognizes the right of communities to choose incorporation if they want. And, um, uh, it provides room for th to do that while remaining within the fellowship of the Islands Trust. I think Peter is absolutely on the money. The time to discuss governance options are once we collect the information. Now one of the things that the three current elected officials did was to specifically ask the government, for the, Im the provincial government, for the impact study on the Islands Trust of Salt Springs Incorporation. Firstly, it will provide the facts, and secondly, it, it will give uh, the capacity to um, defuse any scare moment. You know, we're dealing with a document that is going to be definitive, that is prepared by the governance, that, by the provincial government, that isn't prepared on island, and, and that um, should provide a proper substance for really understanding, will this damage the island's trust or not? Yeah. I think we get that document, we consider that in the light of a full incorporation study, we debate it amicably, without fear mongering, and we make a choice as, as, a, as an informed community. As one of the ex officios in the last process, I would uh, say that it was a really interesting one. We, one of the biggest challenges we had was to try to select a, a committee that was, had broad representation throughout the community without kind of avoiding any uh, community uh, <clears throat> angst on that. And that was a difficult task to, for starters. But one of the things I'd like to recommend, if you haven't read the study, it's got a tremendous amount of information and everybody who's concerned about our community should read. <clears throat> because I think it's a wealth of information put together in, in good faith and uh, with no hidden agendas. So please uh, take that step. Thank you. Earth. Thank you very much. Um, I started out my first term uh, proposing, uh, supporting the idea of, of a study, and um, it's this, uh, that one study happened, uh, 
and now it looks like we have to have another study. Anyways, uh, I, 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 two things. From the perspective of, as, the, as a director, it was, I, I came to realize very quickly that uh, the, there was, if, if we'd had local kind of government, a lot of the issues that came before me um, uh, would have been, uh, I, I would have received input as to how I should support, or what, whether I should support or not, uh, from my community. Uh, it, just a really small example, there was a decision made at the, uh, the regional table that we uh, ban canning uh, for children under the age of 16 in public facilities, okay? Um, so here I am sitting there, you know, thinking, well, so does my community care about this at all? Um, is there, you know, uh, if, if there was a, if that, that was a, a recommendation, excuse me, a bylaw that was going to occur at Locally, that, that bylaw would come to uh, our council. Uh, there would be an opportunity then for people in my community, in the community, to weigh in on whether we should do that, and then a vote would be taken. There was just no way that could happen, um, and uh, I think it's important for us to have an opportunity as a community to weigh in on everything. Uh, and the more local your government is, the easier it is to weigh in on things. So. Uh, Yes, I want incorporation. Thank you. Okay. Uh, just just we have Pardon? Five, you might be on the question. I'm sorry, but I, this, that's what I'm We have half an hour left, people. Uh, can I have a show of hands of how many other questions are in the audience? Okay. Uh, as long as we keep to that, we can still go with the two minute deadline. If it looks as if we're going to be short of time, We'll go back to the original, I'm not changing the rules because we changed the rules and we made two minutes. We'll go back to the original to make sure that those can have the questions answered. <coughs> so be specific, both in your questions and in your answers, please. My name is Ken Rahr. Um, I, well, most people think I've probably been on the island too long. But um, <laughs> uh, I heard, uh, this is a follow up actually to Harry's question right at the beginning. I'm very encouraged to hear the vast majority of you are, are right into the, the tiny houses. I think they're a fantastic thing. Um, of course, in my job, I'm you know, somewhat involved with those. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm really curious to hear uh, Ms. Grimes' um, take on maximum house sizes and how you would go about um, designating sizes. Would you know, say a family of two be able to build a 1,200 square foot house and when they had kids, would they be able to add on, like if in-laws moved in, would they be able to build onto their house, or how, how would you get a maximum house size? Is that, was that what you thought? I'm sorry, maybe I misunderstood. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, but I, I think tiny homes are great. And certainly lots of young people would like more energy efficient homes. And I think that's a movement that could very well be supported by the Island Trust. Next question. John Borsk again. Um, I'm returning again for more. It is our most critical resource on the island, and uh, I'm concerned about future growth uh, on the island because uh, without water, we can't grow. Uh, we have uh, had some problems with recent, uh, uh, the NSSWD uh, new plant being passed and other, and the fire hall being passed. We have SWIPA is going to be proposing some kind of a, uh, major change to the water system for St. Mary Lake and then Christian Lake. So, and also we have a lot of problems with uh, our water systems because of uh, costing a lot of money. And I wonder, uh, because of all the pressures on our increasing water costs, if people are turning to wells, what are we going to do? Uh, because we will then lose our groundwater as well. 
Well, the reason that SWIPA has initiated a water quantity review is to answer that very question. What are the sustainable limits of that essential resource? And, and how do we reconcile our community planning within the limits of that resource? Um, that isn't a short exercise, but it will encompass both surface and subsurface water resources. I expect we'll separate them. SWIPA has agreed on the principle of doing it. We'll establish a subcommittee to take control of that particular process. Um, we have identified the major stakeholders in that process. We have yet to prepare terms of reference and a scope of works, but at least we're underway with the exercise at long last. Next question. I think people were going to have to limit it down to one minute answers um, because some of these answers are going to run into the We have to reserve 15 minutes at the end for the final summarizing statements. My name is Robert Steinbeck, and one of the uh, very important but aging assets that we have on Salt Spring Island is called Lady Minto Hospital. And it is uh, in various states of disrepair and probably declining. I think we might agree with that, but it's a very, very significant resource to our community. I wonder what each of the um, candidates would see as their role in ensuring that we either have a significant upgrade or a replacement hospital in the new, in the long term, and what steps you would be prepared to take to make sure that that happens. Peter. I'm a member of the, of the Foundation Board and we take that um, matter very seriously. This is a matter for Islands Health and we have very little say over it, certainly in terms of Islands Trust. So you can be sure that any, anything that would come before Islands Trust in terms of trying to do something about our hospital or building a new hospital would be very welcomed because that Lady Minto is a jewel in our crown. It's essential to our island. It's essential to our ongoing growth as, as more people come to retire here. Retired people I welcome. They bring money with them. They, have, they, need, they need services. They employ our young people. They provide housing for our young people. So the Lady Minto Hospital must be protected at all costs. Thank you. I, I sit on the uh, Capital Regional Hospital District Board, and one of the things that I, and I also sat on the Lady Mental Hospital Foundation with, uh, with Peter, one of the things I noticed is the fact that the budgets didn't talk to each other. Yeah. If you looked at Island Health, you looked at the Capital Regional Hospital District, and we have about a million dollars a year that gets collected from the taxpayer. We have the Lady Mental Hospital Foundation, which has what I would call a fairly large war chest, and yet we had a, a high priority project, which is the emergency room. And I looked at all the different uh, allocations for the different budgets, and they're all in a different time frame. <clears throat> so what I did is, uh, at one of the last board meeting was to get it passed unanimously that now that we will have a, a, a project to look at all three budgets together so we can leverage each other's funds. So that was endorsed unanimously by the board. Any other responses? I just wanted to say that, you know, a number of years ago, before Wayne started in on this, um, the, the, uh, the health authority did have, had prioritized hospital, a replacement of hospitals. And Salt Spring was number three after the Courtney Comox Hospital, uh, excuse me, number two after the Courtney Comox Hospital. They built a car, they, I, I don't know if it's completed, but they undertook to build the that particular hospital, and all of a sudden, <coughs> Salt Spring was off the list. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now that would be a number of years ago, um, uh, and I it, it just I, I was really upset about that. But anyways, that's not the issue here at the table. And I thought, well, so how well, how does that happen? I mean, how does something? And it, it it appears as it happens because of the health authority or the health uh, the island health whatever they're calling themselves now. They can make the decision as to whether they should be on or off, okay. So I guess to my, I think to myself, okay, so we gotta go on, knock on their door. That's the only thing. Okay. All right, uh, next question. Uh, my name is Gwen McDonald. 
Uh, my question also has to do with health care on Salt Spring Island. Uh, yes, we have a lot of issues around getting into a hospital. That is only one of many, many, many health care issues on this island that are not adequately addressed. Over and over again, in um, exploring some of these unmet health care needs, comes the response that because Salt Spring is not considered a rural area, it is tied in with the Capital Regional District and is viewed as a urban area, should we not perhaps be starting to think about switching from the Capital Region and joining up with the Cowichan Valley Region for our Regional District Directors, which is in fact then considered a rural region and perhaps a better fit for us. And who would like to answer George? Um, I actually explored that very concept. Um, um, I didn't see um, much affinity between Salt Spring and a, muni a, a conurbation, a large uh, a collection of mayors and townships uh, such as the CRD controls. I saw much more affinity with our neighbours in Duncan. And, and I actually had a discussion at uh, uh, the ABIC conference with a couple of the local councillors for there from, from that locality. And there is some warmth to it, but some caution too. We would probably dominate in some respects because of our population size. Um, so we would have to have a very convincing case if we were to make that switch. As it happens, the Capital Regional District uh, or, or there will be some review, it would appear, um, within the CRD area to try and rationalise it. They have too many townships, too many mayors, too many fire chiefs, and it's costing them a fortune. Um, I am being concise as possible. I like that idea, and we have been talking about it, and I like the idea of dominating the group. I'm not worried about it. <laughs> <laughs> but what I know for sure is that in Victoria, we do not dominate. I understand that we sit at the very end of the table. No one, I don't think, really cares very much about us. There's, that there's Wayne, God bless him, and the Southern Gulf Islands uh, director, and the rest of them do whatever they want. So I, I am with you all the way. I would love to see us move to the CPRD. I sit on the very end of the horseshoe. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, one of the things I, I say to the uh, CRD senior staff is uh, the next move for me, I guess, is out the door. <clears throat> but I also make the joke that uh, they think uh, they would really like to see Salt Spring be hauled up to Ida Y. Because we certainly, we certainly take a lot of uh, time with some of our challenges on the island. So it's something I think it would be very complex to do, but certainly worth looking into. Next question. Oh, Kristen. I just wanted to say when I met with the economic, uh, a man from the Salt Spring, Salt Spring Island Economic Commission, um, he had talked about moving from an urban designation to a rural designation, and it would actually provide more money for economic development on the island. Um, if it is possible, and I know that there would be a lot of complicated details in regards to that, but I think I would support that kind of um, that movement. Wayne, very quick, but your second question. Just to give you a specific example, Duncan is considered uh, rural. They got $400,000 from the federal government for economic development. We're considered urban. That's my case. Next question. Thank you. Since we're happy answer to that question, I'd like to hear your answer to the question. My, what, my answer? Yes. Um, uh, well, I just wanted to say that, as Wayne said, we got nothing because we're not rural, um, and that's been a, that's been going on for a long time in a lot of areas. It's just not that particular thing. Would I be in favor of moving to another jurisdiction uh, which we could dominate? I don't know if I am. I really find. I, I mean, I would like to fight the battle in my own jurisdiction and see how we can more resources for my community. Um, it, 
change has always brings a whole bunch of other facts that you have to consider and the startup and so on becomes uh, subject to a lot of uh, questions. So, uh, no. Next question. My name is Wayne Hewitt, and the question I have is regarding the riparian area regulations and agriculture. Agriculture is exempt under the riparian area regulations, so why has the trust not moved forward on taking away the land use for agriculture in rural watershed one and rural watershed two? You currently have, according to the Islands Trust in Victoria, they calculated we have 211 properties that are the most important ones that we need under the RR. Now they're exempt, including my own. So I would like to know why we are moving forward with riparian area regulations before we remove agriculture from rural watershed one and rural watershed two. Thank you. We are obliged to move forward with the RA regulations by provincial law. We are already way behind. And with regard to your concerns about agriculture again, alongside uh, in our watersheds, that is a subject that already has been covered here. And it's certainly very much on the Islands Trust or Local Trust Committee's project list. And we will be addressing that next term. George, do you have a comment on that? Um, I echo what Peter said. The, the, the RAR, we are the last. Uh, communities within the Islands Trust to have RA in place. Uh, the provincial government is, is rapidly running out of patience. We have to do this or we'll be in trouble. And, and we will catch up with the, with the rezoning, believe me. If we're at target. <laughs> and the next question. Hi, my name is Susan Buick. I have a question for the trust candidates. Um, it seems like there's a lot of areas in which you're all on the same page, which is great because it means you're able to work together well. I'm just wondering uh, if there are any issues that any of you feel very strongly uh, differently from the other candidates, like basically what sets you apart from the other candidates um, in regards to issues that you're, you're on a different page. George and I have different accents. <laughs> I can understand mine. I frequently can't understand it. I'm more here. Now they want to speak English. I guess so one of the things that <laughs> one of the things that um, I, I talked to one of the previous trustees and he had mentioned that the OCP had been revised and the bylaws had not been updated yet. And one of the major changes to the OCP was the inclusion of um, of climate change as an issue and, and it's reflected throughout the OCP. So that's, that's something that uh, is supposed to have been done, um, and that's something that I would like to certainly focus on, um, <clears throat> because I think it's crucial, although I know that the, the others also find, are concerned about climate change. So. And uh, yeah, I think that's all. Thanks, Christine. OK, one last question. Somebody had their hand up there in the middle. Wayne, you were going to be waiting. Who's been waiting the longest? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Wayne. Wayne. Hi, I'm Wayne Tepper. Um, given the struggling economic state of business in Ganges and a board work that has been pending for well over 18 years, what would the trustee candidates do to further the completion of the board work? And are, are there other initiatives that you would specifically like to pursue towards bettering the downtown economic development? We are well on the road for the boardwalk. It will be built in 2016, or July the 31st. And so we're working hard on that. We have a charter that's uh, coming before us uh, on Thursday, which sets out how, how this is going to develop, 
how we're going to involve the community, the stakeholders, the landowners, the, the harbour authority, of course, and, uh, and that is a really important thrust and we're, we're working towards it. We're also working closely with the CEDC, um, the Economic Development Commission, we're working closely with the Chamber of Commerce, we're working closely with the, uh, with the, the CRD. All of these initiatives are essential. We're promoting um, business um, on this island because we want jobs, particularly jobs for young people and young families who need, we need around to support you and me. <laughs> Christine. Okay, any other comment on this? I'd like Christine. Christine? So, I think it's really important to support entrepreneurs. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of young people on the island that want to start business, are starting businesses, and um, supporting them would be really important to me. Um, the Economic Development Commission and, and the Chamber of Commerce are doing lots of work. I would want to collaborate with them. I also think that encouraging more housing downtown would be uh, a way of revitalizing the area. Um, I think there's four or five families that own all of the buildings downtown, so it would be, I, I would feel like responsible to go and hopefully meet with them and talk to them about options um, to create a housing that's affordable uh, in the downtown core. The boardwalk uh, yeah. I mentioned earlier that, that I'd like to see the trust undertake more physical planning, and, and Ganges Village Core is one of the areas where we really need all communities that have a planning department or a planning authority undertake physical planning. Very little is done in Salt Spring. Ganges is an absolute oceanside jewel that falls way below its potential. Yes. And, and we could really realize that potential, right? and I think uh, provide a a vibrant and meaningful heart to this island. Um, that's an exercise that we have elevated to our top five priority list, the Ganges Village Master Plan. And the board work is one of the Okay, anything else? Okay, I think that's going to be it. Um, we now start each candidate. You have two minutes to... I, I won't take two minutes. And we'll start right at the beginning here, George. It, it's been an absolute uh, pleasure and privilege uh, being of service these past three years. Um, and I thank you for the opportunity. Um, I'd like to compliment um, our new candidates for having the courage to step forward. It's, uh, it's, they've made a contest out of this, and I think that's really important, because whoever gets into power has a mandate from this community. I want to thank uh, Peter and Wayne for the friendship and the collaboration that I think has been unprecedented during this term in office. And uh, uh, I think teamwork is, has really shown uh, these past three years. Um, I uh, hope I get the opportunity to serve you for another four. If I don't, then I'll take that with good grace. Um, I'll leave the decision in your hands and I'll wait your judgment on the 15th of November. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so thank you all for, for being here and being so engaged in the, the political process. Um, I think something that I, that I do offer, I'm obviously quite young and um, I I believe that my generation and people between you know, 20, 20 and 45 um, have a lot of passion and a lot of spirit and I don't often see them represented at community, at, in political debate, um, um, at the town halls. Um, there's, there's a lack of engagement there. Something I would really like to do is to be able to harness the passion of the people that are in that age group and be able to enfranchise them into the community and help to encourage them to to reach out to other generations and create a, um, just greater cohesion um, in our community.
Thank you, George, for those nice words. It, it has indeed been a privilege to be with you um, and with Wayne, and I hope that we will continue to serve together. But our community faces many challenges. How to maintain our rural nature of our island, which is so important to all of us and also to provide for our community. Some maintain that these two goals are in conflict. I do not share that view. I believe we can and we will build on our past successes and make ever better our wonderful corner of this earth. Our community is and will continue to be resilient in the face of change and sustainable. While we are resist, re resilient and sustainable, we are meeting the needs of change. We must nevertheless adjust to change more quickly. We are working on a long-term sustainability plan which will address those needs. <laughs> Our island population will grow as Canada grows, and people search for rural lifestyles away from the pressures of the city. And we must manage that growth. We must protect our environment and deal with the increasing pressures of climate change. This includes managing our water supply and reducing demands on ground and surface water. And it also means reducing our demands on fossil fuels and increasing the use of renewable energy sources. We must also protect our community. We must ensure employment and housing for young families, as well as looking after the needs of our elder citizens. These are matters that are close to my heart and which I am acutely aware of for every LTC decision that we make and the planning processes that we undertake. And I hope very much that you will allow me the privilege of continuing to work that work. So my message very clearly tonight and very simply is I feel very strongly connected to this community and I am committed to doing my best for you, and I, because I care, I care about this community, I care about our island, I care deeply. Thank you. Vincent? Yeah, so lots talked about, and the hospital came up, that was a really important one, and if the problem said we were on the list and that something should be done, that there's a focus to convince them to uphold their commitment and uh, I guess a lot of it too is the rate of change that's probably the biggest difference between the candidates is that we may not all agree that you know some say we need to move faster and some say we have to cover all the bases and, and not feel like if we move too fast we got to take a step backwards to get it right so a lot of the whole process is just recognizing the needs of everyone in the community we sort of have the same focus, but we don't all agree on how fast it takes place. Thank you. Thank you very much. Chapter two. I didn't finish my opening speech, so you're going to <laughs> So I'll just do a little recap. Uh, uh, I'm not going to make any promises, as I say. However, I will continue to work on affordable housing, public housing, transportation, and water. So, so that is what I want to do. And those are the in the way. The way I think we can do some of this is gas tax funds. Um, it just sits there, and we should use it more effectively. Um, that is. Uh, those are some of the ways that I figure we could do things. That is my vision. It might be perceived as naive by some or delusional, but I shall work as hard as I can to put them into practice. In closing, I would like to say that all activities, programs, projects, work undertaken under my direction shall be looked at through the lens of climate change. Thank you very much. Thank you. I feel right at home because here I'm at the end of the table. <laughs> I thought I'd time my opening speech right, but obviously it was way off. But there's one particular item I'd like to highlight because it's relevant to the election. I spearheaded the successful introduction of voting by mail for the 2014 local election. So it provided an opportunity for a large number who were away during election time. So in, in closing, I'd like to certainly thank all my conferers, the trustees for working together, and everybody at the table that uh, is here tonight and also all of you that are here in spite of all the rain. So I'm gonna, in my closing, I please encourage you to pick up one of my brochures or cards because it's got my platform in it. But I'd like to highlight a couple of things I feel are really important <clears throat> that I want to uh, implement should I have the pleasure of uh, serving again. Working with the Island Trust on an integrated community plan, moving more CRD responsibilities onto Salt Spring Island, critical factor, we need to do that. 
delivery with the key partners implement the priority actions of the Community Economic Development Action Plan. A lot of people don't realize it's part of the CRD, it's not an independent entity. Move to implement the School District 64 CRD Drake Road Affordable Housing Project. Look at supporting different uh, green activities like expanding uh, transit routes. Infrastructure, complete the replacement of the Burgoyne Bay liquid waste facility in one way or the other it's used by everybody on the island in a greener way as possible including looking at a constructed wetlands. Expanding the recreation, secure a field recreation site for new and expanded sports opportunities. The governance, fully supported independent provincial government funded South Spring Island Governance Review of comparative costs of the present system for the municipality. So we have another element to look at. So I bring results, experience, dedication, and balance, and we'll be able to do, with your support, be able to do more next term. And don't you really want to keep your back? <laughs> And I still remember reading about an executive at BC Ferries who, after about three months in the job, made a statement that he said it didn't take very long as an executive at BC Ferries to realize that the greatest thing you could do for world peace is to sink the Gulf Islands. I'd like to uh, thank everybody for coming this morning. Thank you.